is finally the holidays and as you can tell I am clearly in the festive spirit. And yes, I did just spend five minutes wrapping up this package to rip up right away, but you know, with the year that we've had, I think we all deserve a little Christmas treat. So anyways, right here I've got this shiny new, freshly unboxed MacBook Pro that I am procrastinating on setting up. And unlike that iPhone unboxing that I did a month ago, here there's nothing extraordinary or unusual or mind-blowing about this computer, especially since it does not have that new M1 chip. You know, the one with the amazing battery life and blazing speed and crazy performance. Yeah, so I didn't get that model, but I promise you there is a reason for it. And I hope that I am right. So yeah, before we set up this computer, I wanted to play with it for a little bit and chat about why I'm upgrading in the first place and why I chose to skip out on that M1 chip, at least for now. All right, so I've got my old, old computer here, which is the 2019 baseline MacBook Pro. And then here is a new one, which is of course the 2020 model in the mid to higher end of the lineup. Oh, lineup, yeah. So yeah, let's open this up and see what it looks like. Um... So right off the bat, the first thing that I noticed when I opened up this computer is the new keyboard. Now this is a very welcome change from the older models which were using what are called butterfly switches. Now I don't exactly know the mechanism of these, but they basically were very flush to the uh, base and that really hindered the typing experience. So I'm glad that Apple has switched back to this more traditional keyboard layout, which means that when you press a key, there's a lot more travel before it actually registers, kind of like how mechanical keyboards differ from membrane keyboards. Not only that, but there also is an escape button. I think this new keyboard does add a tiny bit of thickness to the computer, but I think we can all agree that's worth it for the better typing experience. But the main reason why I upgraded in the first place was for better specs. And compared to this baseline model, this new computer is a bit higher end, so it has better everything, a better processor, memory, graphics, storage. So all of these specs means that this computer is ready to handle a lot more. I can have more tabs open, more apps open, I can edit my videos better without this computer sounding like a crying whale. I'm also really excited for the new OS, which is called Big Sur. 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 And that means there is finally a UI update after many years. There also are widgets, which are accessible from the top right-hand corner of the screen. I really like using widgets on my phone, so I hope that they will also be useful on my computer, especially once more of my apps actually make compatible widgets. There also are some updates to their in-house apps like Safari and Apple Maps and Mail, which I don't really use. And of course, the upgrade from my old computer to this one is quite incremental, so this is a very familiar experience, but hopefully the performance gains will be worth it. Now, you might be wondering, but isn't your old computer from 2019? Why upgrade so soon? And that is a good question. And all I can say is that I messed up again by being cheap. So I bought this computer back in the summer of 2019, right before I quit my job. And when I bought this, I knew I would be using it for consulting and coding and video editing. But still, I thought it would be a good idea to invest my hard earned money on the cheapest, most bare bones MacBook Pro for less than $1,000. Now, if I was a student and was just writing essays or doing some light coding, I think this computer would have been perfectly fine. But since I knew I was gonna be working for eight to 10 hours a day on this and working with video, which is pretty taxing on a computer, I really should have known better, especially as a CS major. I'm also pretty rough with my computers by not shutting them down and uh, kicking them in my sleep. So that probably didn't help the cause. So eventually enough was enough and this past Black Friday I dropped nearly another $2,000 on this bad boy. 
So basically, by being cheap and trying to save a few hundred bucks, I ended up wasting more than a thousand. <sighs> but finally, now I have learned my lesson that when it comes to equipment, especially something that's gonna last a couple of years, investing in something that'll actually work and last you a long time is definitely worth it, both in terms of your money, but also your sanity <laughs> and productivity. You may also be wondering, but why spend more money not to get the M1 MacBook Pro when it's cheaper and potentially has better performance? Again, that is a good question. Now I do admit there are some really cool things about this chip. In case you missed it, here are some highlights. Yeah, this is now an absolute battery champion. You cannot get this type of power efficiency on any other laptop right now. Specifically the M1 chip inside, has completely changed everything. These M1 Macs are setting up the future of Mac hardware as we know it. So it's pretty impressive what Apple has managed to do to build this system on a chip with an eight core CPU, GPU, neural engine, and more, all packed onto this one small chip. It's almost too good to be true. Better battery life, performance, speed, pretty much everything and all in Apple's first iteration of this thing. And that really is the problem, that this is still a first generation product. Sure, it looks great at all of the Apple events and in demos and on paper, but a lot is still unknown. And if I were to invest in the M1 MacBook Pro, I would pretty much be the guinea pig for an essentially beta piece of hardware. It's kind of like how, say, when Python 1 was released back in the day, a lot was still unknown. Yeah, it was cool and different, but a lot of the kinks still had to be figured out. And that's why it only really gained traction with the 2.0 release maybe a decade later. Or with every new Mac OS update, of course, there are some really cool features, but if you were to install it the moment that it releases, you're bound to find some tiny, but annoying bugs that just take a little bit of time to iron out. So my fear with investing in the M1 MacBook is that I would make the same mistake of getting what is the cheaper model with promising specs, but where down the line I could face some annoying bugs or performance issues, which is what I'm trying to avoid. And the other main issue is that a lot of Mac apps need to release updates to be compatible with the M1 chip. And a lot of my workflow relies heavily on certain non-Apple apps, such as DaVinci Resolve and Notion. In fact, I think right now DaVinci only has a beta out that's compatible with the M1, and I've also heard of issues with running Docker on the M1. So this is basically that awkward in-between period where developers are rushing to roll out updates to make their apps compatible with this chip, which means that I, as a user, might be running non-optimized software or beta software that could have bugs or issues that uh, I don't want to deal with. And so I'm gonna take MKBHD's advice, which is if I were a student or an everyday user, I think the M1 would have been perfect. But since I am, I guess, a power user, I can't really afford to take that risk. And anyways, if the M1 is so good as it is right now, I can only imagine how much better it'll get in one or two years. So I might as well wait a little bit longer. <laughs> that being said, I do have some FOMO seeing other people rave about their computers. So hopefully MKBHD is right on this. Okay, okay, enough chatting. Let's actually go and set this up now. So I'm really weird about having my scroll direction in the opposite direction. So I already swapped that right away. So now let's update the wallpaper and some of these settings. All right, now let's download the apps. And I'm gonna try to keep this as bare boned as possible, especially since I don't really use that many apps nowadays. Of course, we have to start with Chrome. And now that that's done, let's add Notion and Spotify and Discord. And by the way, I do have a Discord server, which I'll link down below if you want to join. <laughs> And then there are a few more niche apps that I use for editing, specifically DaVinci Resolve and Audacity. Now I use DaVinci to edit all of my videos and Audacity is what I use for my voiceovers and just modifying audio. 
And finally, an app that I've tried recently and have really been enjoying is called Things. Now, this is pretty pricey at $50, but so far I'm really enjoying it as a simple, no fuss to-do list. I'll probably make a dedicated video on this in the future, but yeah, for now, these are all of my apps. So now let's actually get to work. So yeah, that's it for today's video. Now it should come to no surprise that this computer is working out great so far, but I do hope that the bump in specs under the hood will really help boost my productivity and just make things run a lot smoother. So yeah, let's wish this guy good luck. And otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season and Christmas. And I'd love to know how you're celebrating this year, even if it looks a little bit different. I know for me, I'll be doing a lot of baking and watching movies and playing with the dogs. So I'm excited for that. But yeah, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give it a big like and subscribe. Follow me on social media if you haven't already. And I'll see ya in the next one. Frightful, but the chai is so delightful. <laughs>